his his zeal for for sharing the message. He is currently still works with the uh, congregation in College Station, Texas, the College Station Church of Christ in College Station, Texas. He's not in full time ministry there anymore, but I imagine he would he would say that he seems like he's in full time ministry because he does stuff like this all the time. His message for us this evening is restoring the glory of worship, and he told me to keep it short, so I'll give it to you. Actually, I'm, uh, when I left doing local work, I started doing interim work. Um, is this going to be here the whole time? I Sorry. Are the sound guys having a... Okay. I, I'm doing interim work. I've, uh, this, I started my third one uh, in the 1st of uh, September. And I, I attend the a and church when I'm not out of town, and I teach classes there. So I just wanted you to know that I'm still affiliated with the a and church, but um, not their local preacher anymore. I have, um, I've wrestled over this uh, theme that Richard gave me. I guess it was his fault. <laughs> Restoring... Restoring the glory of worship. If this was a class, I would I would ask you, uh, what would, how would you approach something like this? What's the key to restoring restoring the glory of worship? I immediately, my thoughts immediately turn to Sunday morning, Sunday night. Generally, if if you walked up to one of us without introduction or um, warning and asked and, and ask you to, as someone asked you to talk about worship, I mean, wouldn't, wouldn't you probably think first about Sunday morning? You're just going to sit there? <laughs> or Sunday night or... Uh, I. I and it's, I don't know how you would, I don't know how you would go about restoring that. And I don't know what your vision would be of what restoration would mean. Um, you know, I thought, and, and I don't want to go, it is, often we think about structural things, like having five song leaders instead of one. Or uh, singing new songs instead of old songs. Or uh, clapping hands or raising hands or d being more assertive and open or whatever, however you would want to describe that. Maybe sinful, some of you would say. Uh, but I think it's bigger than that, this idea of restoring the glory of worship. I don't really think it has anything to do with structure and form and planning and guidance. I think there's, a, there's a, a, a something much bigger about worship wherever it takes place, whether it's in the, the privacy of your devotional time or whether it's Sunday morning or a Sunday night or a time like this or class time, or uh, years ago I was up hunting elk in New Mexico with Dr. Lloyd Scow from Raptone and his son Lauren, and we had uh, been up on the mountain all week, and we came back on a Sunday morning, and we went to Lauren's cabin there on the Canales River in uh, southern Colorado, and uh, Doc and Lauren and I found some crackers and some juice, and we had communion together, and we worshiped. One of my favorite things to do is uh, hunting, and I love being out early in the morning before the sun comes up and sitting on the edge of a mountain or sitting uh, in, a, in a deer blind in Texas, which is the best we can do down there because there's no open land. And uh, I, I was with my grandson in a blind one morning, and we were sitting there in the dark, and I said, now, uh, uh, Clayton, I want you to just sit here and be real quiet. 
And the first thing you're going to hear when the world starts waking up is the chirping of the birds. That's the first thing that's going to happen. So we're sitting there, and one of the birds started cheeping, chirping, and he elbowed me, you know, and we watched the, watched the morning wake up. When I was in college, I went with Stanley Ship on a uh, summer mission trip to France, and I was sleeping on the airplane. It was my first or second airplane ride, and I woke up in the morning, and I looked out the window of the airplane, and there was this beautiful, calm, blue ocean and this beautiful, uncloudy blue sky that were almost the same color, and there was one ship in the water, and you could see the white water coming up off of the fantail. And for a moment, I worshipped. I think restoring the glory of worship has more to do with me than it has to do with structure or forms or what's going on around me. And I thought about some moments in Scripture where worship boiled out of people in different circumstances. It was personal. It was emotional. It was significant. It had something to do with what God had just done or Jesus had just done. It had something to do with the hand of God that was finally revealed in some magnificent way. And for the first time, those that had waited on God to move saw him move. And there was worship. So my intent tonight is to share some stories with you from Scripture about people who at different moments in their lives were moved by something. And the message for all of us, ultimately, is, um, am I moved by God? Do my, does my contemplation, do my songs move me toward God? One of the dangers, I think, of corporate worship is... It can be wrote. Um, singing songs and not perhaps catching the glory of it all because it is something that we've done so many times. I, so I'm struggling to try to do this tonight because... It is, it is my challenge to make, glorious, to make worship glorious. I can't do it for you. I mean, if anybody could, I could. But uh, I, can't, I can't do it for you. And you can't do it for me. We're going to have an invitation song at the end of this tonight. And if these words, these words from God that I have sewn together in this presentation about the glory of worship, if, if we are drawn into God's presence in some way and our heart is, is moved, if there's a stirring in us where we need to come to God, maybe someone has, has never been baptized even though maybe intellectually they know that they should. Maybe someone needs prayers like we witnessed uh, the other evening. Maybe there is something that will happen in this period of considering worship personally that may spark a need to say, I have a need before God. And the question is, you know, for me, as I present this, if I ever get to it, uh, can I do that? One of the things about preaching that is important to me is that it's just not that the words that I say and the words that I gather up from God's word 
or rehearse from God's message to others has some meaning to me first. It can't just be a job or a presentation. So we're going to have just some stories from Scripture. And the first one that struck my mind relative to worship was John chapter 9, the man that had been blind from birth. And this, this story is about simple, straightforward, honest, uh, spiritual, a spiritual awakening that this blind man had. Jesus was going along with his disciples, and they saw a man blind from birth. Now, this fellow is well known in the town. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Neither this man nor his parents sinned, Jesus said, but this happened so that the work of God might be displayed in his life. Now, that's the point of God coming into our world through Christ. It's the point of Scripture. It's the point of God in dwelling us with his spirit is so that the work of God might be displayed to us personally. And you know this story. It's, it's well known. And so Jesus, uh, neither this man nor his parents sinned, but this happened so that the work of God might displ dis be displayed in his life. As long as it is day, we must do the work of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. He's talking to a blind man. Having said this, and this is unique, he spit on the ground, made some mud with the saliva, put it on the man's eyes, go, he told him, and wash in the pool of Siloam. So, he, so the man went and washed and came home seeing and now, the rest of the story is comical to me. Because the Pharisees, and here's, here's where we begin to find ourselves in this activity of the glory of God. I'm not going to believe that. I'm not going to respond to that. I'm not going to even consider the idea of letting God in at this point in my life. And that's the Pharisees. So they go, th they go through this whole logistical... Uh, convoluted try at discounting what they all had just witnessed. The whole town knew this man. These, this family was a member of the synagogue. They went to the uh, Linder Street Church of Christ, and everybody knew who they were. And the guy had been blind from birth, and they knew his name, and they knew who he was. And the Pharisees decide that they're going to investigate this and so they first they go and they talk to the man he says the man they called Jesus made some mud put it on my eyes he told me to go to Siloam and wash so I went and washed and then I could see where is this man they asked him he said I don't know they brought to the Pharisees the man who had been blind now the day on which Jesus had made the mud was a, a Sabbath therefore the Pharisees asked him how he received his sight watch the simplicity he put mud on my eyes, the man replied, and I washed, now I see. So the Pharisee said, this man's not from God, for he does not keep the Sabbath. But others asked, how can a sinner do a miraculous sign? So they were divided. They were having a religious argument with each other over the appropriateness of the whole miracle and whether or not it could have happened. Finally, they turned again, number two to the blind man, what have you to say about him? It was your eyes he opened. The man replied, he's a prophet. The Jews still didn't believe it, that he'd been blind and had received his sight, so they sent for his parents. Is this your son? Is this the one that they, you say was born blind? Now watch the parents. They're, you know, they're afraid the elders are going to church him. We know he's our son, the parents answered. We know he was born blind, but how he can see now or who opened his eyes, we don't know. Ask him. He is of age. He'll speak for himself. His parents said this because they're afraid of the Jews. So the second time, they summoned the man who had been blind. Give glory to God, they said. We know this man is a sinner. And the man replied, whether he's a sinner or not, I don't know. But one thing I do know, I was blind and now I see. See how simple it is? They asked him, well, 
What did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He said, I've already told you how he opened my eyes. Why do you want me to hear it again? Do you want to become his disciples too? Now you got it, because it's funny, isn't it? I wonder if anybody was going to laugh at that, because it's funny. Then they hurled insults at him and said, you're this fellow's disciple, we're disciples of Moses. And they go on and berate him for a while. And the man says, we know that God does not listen to sinners. He listens to the godly man who does his will. Nobody's ever heard of opening the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he can do nothing. So to this they replied, you were steeped in sin at birth. How dare you lecture us? And they threw him out. Logic, reason, experience, none of it made sense to the Pharisees. But this blind guy had one argument. I can see you. <laughs> you know, they're saying, who was the guy? I don't know, but I can see you. That was his only argument. Jesus heard they'd thrown him out, so Jesus looked him up. Now, how do you think this guy's feeling right now, this guy? I mean... He's been blind his whole life, and now he can see. How do you think he's feeling? You know, think about the story. Think about the words you would use to describe how this individual, this fellow, is feeling. Do you believe in the Son of Man? Who is he? The man asked. Tell me so I may believe in him. You have seen him. In fact, he's the one speaking with you. The man said, Lord, I believe, and he worshipped him. Now, what do you think that worship was like? You know, what did he do? Did he fall down on his knees? Did he start singing songs? Did he organize a group of people to sit in the pews? And I'm not criticizing, looking at the back of each other's head and say, okay, now we're all going to sing praises to God. That's fine. It's fine to do that. Do you understand what I'm trying to get at here? This, this worship grew out of the work that God had done in his life. And when he realized that he was talking to the light of the world... He worshipped him. Story number two. In Matthew 28, Mary Magdalene is at the tomb. In John chapter 20 and verse 11, she was weeping. And she went and the tomb was empty. And she looked in the tomb and there was an angel. Now... We have to go back and pick up the story and understand how Mary must have been feeling at this moment in her life, probably much like the twelve. This one whom I love, whom I follow, the one that I have been there with him from the beginning until now, is gone. The disciples are afraid. And the angel... <laughs> You know, the whole story is remarkable. The angel says to Mary Magdalene, he's, he, he's, uh, he's risen. Yeah, he's risen. He's not there anymore. He's risen. So she, the Bible says, she was afraid and filled with joy, and she ran to the disciples. Now, the rest of the story is, when they hear it, they all run back. And guess who's at the front of the pack? You know, the same guy that got out of the boat. And Jesus says in verse 9, greetings. <laughs> she clapped, she clasped his feet and worshipped him. The, the words that I would think of are relief, disbelief. 
You know, it's one of those things that you see it and you know it happened, but you say, well, that's unbelievable. And, and so she clasped his feet and worshipped him. What that moment must have been like. She thought he was gone, now he's alive. In the context of Jesus' death and crucifixion, following him around those years, excited, she clasped his feet and worshipped him. 1 Corinthians chapter 14. That's the chapter that we spend a lot of time in talking about corporate worship, and it is corporate worship. But the Corinthians had, like they did to the Lord's Supper, into a mess. When they came together, the Bible says that everyone had a hymn or a prophecy or a tongue or a word of instruction. And it seemed to me as though their services were a little less organized than ours, more, a little bit more unorganized. And someone would have a prayer, and someone would have a hymn, and someone would have a prophecy, and someone would have a tongue. And, a, and it, it sounds like, when you read contextually, that they were just kind of once. And one person would get up to speak in tongues, and he didn't have an interpreter, so nobody knew what the guy was talking about in the first place. And another guy's over here starting a song. And then you got over here with a word of knowledge, and he's trying to share that, this teaching, and he's being interrupted by the guy that's, or he was over here, that is speaking in tongues. And it's a, it, you know, it, it's a big mess. And Paul teaches them in 1 Corinthians 14. He says, listen, this is the word about, four, I think, 14 times. Everything you do together as a people needs to be done so people can be built up, edified. Everything. So if you have a word of knowledge, take turns. If you have a tongue, wait for an interpreter. So he gives them instructions about how to play nice when they're gathered together in assembly. And it's that way, if someone comes in and they hear your word of prophecy and they are convicted that they're a sinner, they will, verse 25, fall down and worship God. You see, the reason their corporate gathering for singing and praying and communing had to be done in a, decently, in a decent and orderly way, number one, is God is not the author of confusion, and number two, if you don't do it in a decent and orderly way, there's not going to be any edification. So if somebody stood up right now in our little gathering and started singing a song, of course, you all would be relieved. You would wave me off and ask the guy to continue. <laughs> but you can't have all of this stuff going on at once. And, and the reason was because if someone came in that didn't know Jesus and they learned of Jesus and realized they were a sinner, Paul says, they would say, God is among you. And they would fall down and worship God. In Genesis chapter 49, Jacob renamed Israel. Hallelujah. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the, the fathers of the Jewish nation, and Jacob had his own story. He wrestled with the angel. He started out as a thief. He wasn't a great guy, but God decided that it was Jacob that he would use instead of Esau. That's why in Romans, the Bible says, Jacob I loved and Esau I hated. That's too strong a word there, but there's not a better translation apparently because no one has changed it. But the point was, in Romans, God chose to use Jacob. And Jacob had this long, convoluted journey with God. There were times when he was as strong as he could be, and there were times when he just wrestled with God. 
And it was indicative, it was prophetic of how the nation of Israel would be once it had developed from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Israel would always wrestle with God like their father Jacob did. So at the end of his life, in Genesis 49, he's gathered up his, he's gathered up his sons and he leans on his staff and he worships. So you've got the blind man worshiping. You've got Mary Magdalene worshiping. You've got the man who comes into the assembly, who falls down and worships God. And you've got Jacob leaning on his staff, probably thinking back about his history, like your history. I mean, I think back to my history. I was telling somebody during the uh, supper tonight, this special closed meeting for uh, speakers, <laughs> of which you weren't invited, because you don't rate. Just throw a little pride out there. And uh, I look back on my life in Rat Tone, and I was telling about Wally Clark. He, Wally Clark was an ele uh, uh, electronics guy that traveled all over northern New Mexico and preached. And once they, right when you came up out of the water in that baptistry in Raton, Wally was standing there on the steps with a pitch pipe in his hand, and he grabbed you up almost, this is hyperbole, dry you off, take you in the back room, teach you how to lead singing, and then he would drug us all over northern New Mexico as he preached, and we did the, I did the Lord's Supper and led singing. We all have history. And I think back on that history, and I think about my grandpa Forey, who was a rancher in northern New Mexico, and he, both of my granddads were uh, homesteaded that land out there in the later part of the 1800s. And grandpa started the church in Raton, New Mexico, after my grandma baptized. Well, she taught him. I hope she didn't baptize him. <laughs> but anyway, that's... <laughs> is a, misspeak. And anyway, and uh, L.O. Sanderson wrote an article about my granddad and the Firm Foundation, and that's my heritage, and I wear his elk ivory ring that he gave, mama gave me when grandpa died, and that's how Joseph felt about his history with God. That was his lineage, and these blessings that he was handing out were blessings from God and prophecy from God. And he leaned on his staff because he was old and decrepit and he did his blessing and then he worshipped God. You see, the theme running through Scripture is that you and I have been blessed by this invisible God that we worship, that we love, that has walked into our lives and given us all a second and a third and a fourth and a fifth and a sixth chance depending on your sordid history. In Hebrews chapter 12, there is a contrast between what happened at Sinai and what happens now. Sinai was a, a mountain. It was full of of gloom. And Jesus, or the writer of Hebrews, speaks to us and he says, but you have come to Mount Zion, to the heavenly Jerusalem, the city of the living God. You've come to thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly, to the church of the firstborn, whose names are written in heaven. You've come to God, the judge of all men, to the spirits of righteous men made perfect. Now, I, when I read that, and I, I'm pro, I, I may be wrong about this, but I have this picture of the heavenlies that Paul talks about in Ephesians. Second tier dimension that exists out there where Jesus sits at the right hand of God and you and I have been raised up to sit with Christ in the heavenlies. All of our spiritual blessings come from the heavenlies. And Paul ends by, in 6 by saying to Ephesians, our struggle's not against flesh and blood, but against the principalities and the powers and the uh, 
da, 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 da. in this dark world, the, the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenlies. That's what our real struggle is. And he raises up with the eyes of faith like Moses in Hebrews chapter 11 where the Bible says, uh, Moses saw him who was invisible. And there's an invisible reality to which you and I are called. We're not just sitting here in this visible world by ourselves. There's thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly right now. You know, we always say that when somebody's baptized. Don't we, don't we have a verse that says the angels rejoice? You know, another great addition to this whole angel story is, is Job chapter 38, when God finally speaks to Job and his friends who can't figure anything out. And he says, now that you've spoken, let me speak. And there's this one passage in Job chapter 38 where then, then the Lord, and this is going to fit with the, the are you all following me? Okay, this is going to fit with getting us out of this world that this visual world that we live in and taking us up into the heavenlies where the angels are, where the spirits of righteous men made perfect are. The Lord answered Job out of the storm. He said, Who is this that darkens my counsel with words without knowledge? Brace yourself, and I will question you, and you will answer me. Here are your questions. Basically saying, you know it all. Where were you when I laid... There's a neat phrase in here that and I hope you capture it. I'm going to make, bring it up, but look for it. It's about the angels. Where were you when I laid the earth's foundation? Tell me if you understand. Who marked off its dimensions? Surely you know. Who stretched a measuring line across it? On what were its footing set? Or who laid its cornerstone while the morning stars sang together and all the angels shouted for joy? You see it? Oh, you're a hard bunch. <laughs> you see, on what, on what were its footing set or who laid its cornerstone while the morning stars sang together and all the angels shouted for joy? That's what you and I have. This invisible God who, who made this outrageous movement to us by coming into this world and in divesting himself of deity and becoming a human being and living like we live and being and tempted like we are tempted and dying on the cross for our sins, the ultimate sacrifice of God following the pattern of Le the Levitical sacrifices in Leviticus 1 through 6. And that is the mountain to whom you and I have come. See to it that, do, that you do not refuse him who speaks. If they did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, how much less will we if we turn away from him who warns us from heaven? At that time his voice shook the earth, but now he has promised once more I will shake not only the earth but also the heavens. The words once more indicate the removing of, the removing of what can be shaken, that is created things, so that what cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, since we are receiving... a a reign of God that cannot be shaken. Let us be thankful and so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe. Oh. I'm trying, you know, I'm, I'm trying to capture what I cannot capture trying to use, that's why I'm struggling so, trying to use words. Psalm chapter 8 and verse 9. 
How majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. Consider the heavens, the work of his hand, the moon and stars set in place. Romans chapter 1 verse 20 and 21 tells us that if we take a long culture, we can learn two things about God. We can learn that he is powerful and that he is divine. And those kinds of thoughts should create in us a reverence and an awe and an excitement that is unexplainable. We should, and I say we should, not like we're not. It's just that being moved into this new or second reality. The glory of worship is captured in the moments when we revere and when we recognize and when we experience and when we embrace and when we realize and when we're touched. I remember when I went forward, I was at the Lubbock Christian College Summer Youth Lectureships in 1963. And I had been thinking about being baptized because I had some sins in my past, like that 50-cent piece I stole from a guy at the diner down at the drugstore and other stuff. We used to steal cigarettes out of the washeteria lady's drawer. When she went back to the back of the laundry, we'd run in and steal cigarettes, go smoke them in the weeds. And, I, you know, I had, I had bad language, and I had things in my life that I... I knew for a boy who was raised to know Jesus were, were wrong. And I remember that night when Bruce Simmer, the student, was preaching. I have no idea what he was preaching about or what it was. But there a, a moment came in my life when I was touched in my heart to say, now's the time to give my to Jesus. Now that's worship. And you and I sing these songs. It is... If we want to restore the glory of worship, it has to begin with us individually by faith capturing the majesty and the glory and the divinity and the beauty and the patience and the loveliness of this God who walked into this world and saved us from ourselves. And I don't know how, I don't know how to restore that if indeed it needs restoring because the only person in whom I can restore the glory of worship is me. I don't have, I don't have any other, I don't have way to look at this topic and I'm glad I'm sorry that Richard's not here but I'm and I'm sorry he's sick but I'm glad he's not here because I'm afraid he had another idea that I didn't get so don't tell him about this <laughs> do y'all understand what I'm trying to get at here shout for joy to the Lord all the earth Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before Him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is He who made us, and we are His, we are His people, the sheep of His pasture. Enter His gates with thanksgiving. Enter His courts with praise. Give thanks to Him and praise His name. For the Lord is good, and His love endures forever. I like that one. His faithfulness continues throughout all the generations, and that's why Jacob worshipped on his staff. Because God had been faithful. He'll hang in there with you when you feel like you can't take a, another step. Restoring the glory of worship 
is trying to capture the glory of the majestic, marvelous, invisible God. And one of these days, one of these days, he's going to come rolling out of heaven. And my grandpa Forey, and my grandma Grove, and my daddy and my mom are going to be right there with him. And I'm, going to, I'm probably still going to be alive. And I'm going to look up and probably fall down and worship God. And that's for us to do. And if it's a song or a scripture, a private moment, a public moment, that is mine to restore. And if we all restore it, what a restoration that would be. And it's not a criticism. Of, of, I'm not trying to criticize anything. I just know that when... I keep wanting to call Richard David, so I'm just going to call him David. When David assigned me this passage, you know, I started fretting over it. What should I say to you? And I decided, I'm not going to say anything to them. I'm going to say this to me. Because that's my job and your job. To let God in. Be like that blind man who said, I don't know how he forgave my sins. There wasn't a white pipe coming out of the baptistry with my sins washing down out of the, into the sewer. I don't know how he does what he does. I don't know how the Holy Spirit speaks to God on our behalf or how he creates in us his fruit. I don't know any of the answers to those remarkable, unimaginable questions. But I know this. Right now, I'm restored because God said to me. And now is the moment when we say to God, if I'm stirred, I'm not just going to say the words in a song. I'm going to come to God. And if you're stirred to come to be baptized or you're stirred to go pray with somebody or you're stirred to repent or to sing louder than you ever sang or I'm not going to bring up some other stuff that you could do. It's our moment to restore the glory of worship. It's my job to be stirred by God. And the best words of the night while we stand and sing. Is a habitation built.